Is there anything that you feel like you still need work healing in order to let certain things go? Or are these things always going to be with us at certain times? Different stresses or pains or wounds or PTSD from the past of our individual lives? Look, the notion that when you heal, it, something utterly disappears is one component of healing. Mm -hmm. But the other part is that you need a bigger trigger to mm. reactivate an old wound, but there is a whole new range right. where the wound can live without huh. being activated. Right, you've healed a certain amount of triggers, but there might be a bigger. So you know, you right. You come back from the from from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from you know all the wars that people have fought here, um, and you or, or or you are a refugee from Syria or from Afghanistan. I mean, all sides. You may not at every siren jump mm. anymore. But if suddenly but if there's a bomb, yeah. <laughs> yes, right. you will jump. Gotcha. So the, the, the range and the response, mm -hmm. you know, to the danger shifts. Gotcha. That's the piece around healing. I think for me, it was a real surprise, this, this fear that I got to experience. I didn't remember that. I, it had been a long time. Since, because I you're thought, constantly doing the work. You're yes, constantly in the... I thought yeah. I have kind of created a life where I have a sense of ownership. I have a sense of control. I have a sense... But I always live with dread. You do? I do. Still today? That, that my whole life. Live with dread like... That every minute something could happen. That the sky would, could fall and... The yeah. whole thing could disappear. Really? Because that is the, the, the core story of my family. And, mm -hmm. um, but I don't have the dread all the time. But when it grips, <laughs> now, grips. in the past, it would grip without anything happening. It mm. just was like happening to me because I had a day where I just didn't know what I was going to do with my life. So it disappeared. I could talk about it, but I wouldn't necessarily feel it. Mm -hmm. It's physical. It's visceral. It's like you described the chest. For me, yes. it's the gut. It says, Ugh. right. But when the pandemic arrives, it's a trigger that is strong enough to bring back that sense of dread. Absolutely. And at that time, I wasn't aware of my dread. I was feeling my dread. Yeah. That's very different. That's what I mean by the external versus the internal. Now, what do people struggle with? People have struggled with prolonged uncertainty. Here are the five things of the pandemic that mm -hmm. have affected relationships the most. Yeah. One is a prolonged sense of uncertainty. It's not just that you're not sure when this is going to end, but you're not sure about you're not being sure. <laughs> okay, this thing keeps coming and going mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. One minute you say it's gone, the next minute you realize, oh, it's not gone at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, that. Then it's the notion of what we experienced was a collapse of all the boundaries. Here I am, I'm at home, I'm on my chair, at my kitchen table, and I am a therapist and a supervisor and a podcaster and a mother and a friend and a wife and, 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 and I haven't left the chair oh, and I'm still just in sweatpants with the, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, where is work? Where is life? Where is morning? Where is night? Where it's just like all the roles have mm -hmm. collapsed mm -hmm. and we are not made like this. We are physical people and we are spatially oriented and we change location for our activities we change clothes for our activities and they help us enter the role now i'm going to work now i'm going to play sports now i'm going to the club now i'm going out now i'm going to visit my mother <laughs> and yes. i look i feel different i look different i wear different i have rituals i have things a different bag a different racket none of this do you know what it means when your entire arsenal of rituals that give meaning and frame your parts dissolves, yeah. you get exhausted. Mm -hmm. So that was the collapse of boundaries. Then there was the sense of ambiguous loss. You know, we lost spontaneity. We lost f plans. We lost the, the weddings, the graduations, the parties, the promotions, every, sports, games, everything. everything yeah. It's not, there is the loss of death, but there is that other loss. The buildings that are standing, but they're empty. Ooh. They're physically present, but emotionally <sighs> vacated. We have the grandparents and the parents that are physically gone, but emotionally present. We mm. call that ambiguous loss. When you are either physically present and psychologically gone, or psychologically present and physically gone. Yes. 
that ambiguous loss became a part of what then Adam Grant began to describe in the languishing. Languishing is you're not depressed, you're just like eh, lifeless, flat, listless. Nothing is really giving you the sense of meaning and Mattering, purpose and yeah. joy that mm -hmm. you generally want. That has happened in your relationship. And what happens when you are in a period of liminality like this, where the big dilemmas are not getting answered, is that all the unknowns are filtering onto your relationships. <laughs> and the relationship becomes the holder of all that stress. And that is part of the divorce rate mm -hmm. at the moment and the weight that has felt on the relationships. It's not just people didn't get along. Is that people needed in the relationships to deal from the political polarization to the racial reckoning to the economic insecurity to the ambiguous loss to the prolonged uncertainty. Oh All gosh. of that fell on relationships. This is the story of the last two years that people know, they feel it, but they don't necessarily articulate it. Hard to make a relationship last if you don't have the tools and you're not willing to work right. through it. How do you stay grounded when the ground itself is moving? It's quicksand. It's the yeah. great adaptation of this moment. Yeah. And so relationships began to see the cracks inside their relationship and people also began to see the light that shines through the cracks, mm -hmm. both ends. Yes. Well, play is key in a relationship and I'm glad that I'm playful and uh, I'm down for this game. Where should we begin? I'm going to hook you to this game so that you and Marta <laughs> get to all the tell time. stories to each other yes. like never before. This is a game that, that came to you. You know, this is one of the things that came to you during the pandemic because you wanted to have creativity, you wanted to have play, connection, all these different things. So you created this game, Where Should We Begin? A Game of Stories by Esther Perel. And there's no winner, there's no loser, so it's not the type of game I, you know, I'm used Typically. to playing. Typically. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we, we, have, we both have a set of cards. Uh, do I pick any or no, should I give you, you one? No, you pick from mine. I'm okay. going to have you pick from I'll, mine. Should I, I go that. first or you go first? Yeah, you go first. You sure? Yeah. Let's go the safest one. <laughs> okay, so then I pick and do I get to say if I want to answer it or not? Or no, I you have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I have to answer it. Okay. A rule I secretly love to break. A rule. Um, when are you rule breaking? I feel like I'm always breaking the... So but it's a story. Okay, I can tell a story. Okay. It's a story. Yeah, okay. Why? Well, I always because break. I actually think stories, relationships are stories. Mm -hmm. Stories are bridges to, uh, for, to each other. Stories bind us. So here's, is, a, here's a rule I like to break ah, consistently. Yes. In, since we're going on the story of play, mm -hmm. in some ways I feel like I've emotionally and physically matured and grown up in other ways i feel like i've kept this childlike curiosity mm, inside of me mm. it's one of the reasons why i love to interview people and do the podcast uh it's one of the reasons i try to make people feel uncomfortable when i meet them for the first time by asking them questions that maybe they wouldn't have uh you know answered with a stranger uh so one of the things i love to break is in my relationship is trying to bring play to every moment even when it's stressful. Do you like to be goofy? I love to be goofy, love to be silly, and tease. And I think there's a difference between teasing and bullying. I don't want to be a bully. It's a world apart. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't want to be a bully, but I love to be playful and tease and just throw a little, oh, what about this? You know, a little comment here. Martha, she says that she thinks I was like, you know, a Mexican in another life because I have, she says I have the humor not of a white person from America, but of a Mexican, because I'm teasing and playful, and I have a sarcasm that she says is similar to the way that she grew up. So I think, uh, for me, I don't take anything too seriously, and especially in the relationship, which is why I love that you said play is one of the keys to success, and which is why if someone is not reciprocal, then it becomes challenging if they're not wanting to play it's with like you. It's like throwing a ball that drops the floor. Yeah, you're playing ping pong and it just yeah. with yourself, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that is a rule I love to, to, to secretly break, is just being being a child, having childlike energy, but having maturity at the same time. Nice. Yes. Okay. So then what? I finished the card, oh, and now it's your turn, right? Right now we're doing it like this. But, you know, sometimes I put two, two cards, and then 
I get to pick for the other person okay. or people pick themselves. Then we have little orange tokens in which when you play with a group, we can put pressure on the card. Ooh. And then we have the group says, we want you to talk about this. So mm. it becomes very... To make some kind of like have someone do it, yes. yes. So there's all kinds of variations, but it's... I kind of want to do a sex one with you, but I think we took all those cards out. But here, I'll let you just choose one. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for us to take them out, so I was going to go... I know, I should have. Oh, God. The most humiliated I've ever felt. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. You the know, most embarrassing or humiliating no, I, story. No, I, I can tell you immediately the thing. It's, 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 I'm like 10, 11. So okay. it goes what is back it? a long time. I, I, I stole a candy. Oh, that's it? <laughs> well, you don't want to be caught. You got caught. <laughs> I got caught. By who? The, your parents? By the store person? By a person? person that was waiting in line. They saw you. That saw me oh, and man. said to the person. She stole this. No way. <laughs> what did you have to do? I gave it back. Oh, man. And she said, you have to pay for it. I said, I don't want it. She said, you have to pay for it. I said, I don't have the money. She said, you leave me something and then you come back with the money. Wow. So you have to pay for it even though you didn't take it? Well, I didn't have the money. Oh, wow. So I went home. I got the money. Because I had to leave my, my school back. Oh, my gosh. Oh, you had to leave, like, some collateral, some, yes. like, your ID or yes. your phone at the time. Yes. Yes, I had to leave collateral. And, but and it, bring money back. Uh, That's so embarrassing. It's humiliating. It's like, you know, yeah, because if you're going to take something, you're not supposed to take the whole point of it. Is then I get caught. Is not to be caught. You know, it's interesting. I And I probably love this because I bet other people have conversations when you answer, and then it triggers something in someone else. Um Yes. I, I stole for a couple years from, I don't know, 10, 11, somewhere around there, 11, 12. Save it, yeah. What was candy, your team? Candy all the time. Also candy. Right, candy. And I thought I was so smooth. I never got caught from a store. But one time I went to my, this was the most humiliating probably and embarrassing and probably most shameful thing, you know, as a kid growing up. I, my dad brought me and a friend of mine after basketball practice to go to one of his clients. He sold life insurance. And we had to drive, I don't know, 45 to an hour away to a farm. He was like a client of his at a farm in Ohio. And we go there and my dad's like, okay, you got you kids like hang out on the farm or whatever in the house and walk around. I got to talk to Mr. So-and-so for an hour to go over stuff. So we're walking around, nosy little kids, you know, 12 years old, go down in the basement and I'm like opening up drawers. I'm doing stuff I shouldn't do. And I see a wallet. I take out the wallet. I open it up. There's a $20 bill and a $5 bill. And we're looking at each other. We're like, should we do this? I'm like, he will never know. I take the five. My friend takes the 20. Ah! I get woken up that night at, I don't know, 4 a.m. in the morning. And my dad is hovering over me. At this time, my dad's pretty intimidating still. And he's hovering over me. Did you steal from so-and-so money? And I go, no. Right away, I'm like, am I dreaming? Am I awake? I'm like, no, I'm defending myself, right? Lied right to my dad. And he goes, Mr. So-and-so um, was going to buy food for like his cows, right? Or for his like animals on the farm. Ooh. And he doesn't have the money to go buy the food. Like it's gone. I go, I don't know. I don't know what happened. You know, I just lied. But I was also like waking up. I was like disoriented. And then he calls my friend's parents and he admits to it. And it was the most humiliating, embarrassing, shameful thing because I had to drive back alone. My friend didn't have to go, but I drove back for the hour with my parents in the front seat, me in the back seat, just so ashamed. And I had to go face this guy and say, I'm sorry, with like the most, you know, he was just so frustrated and angry and upset. And I never stole again after that. So I don't know, did you steal after that moment? No, you know, I, my, my moment is I'm taking the thing and somebody goes like this. No, they did that? Yes. No way. <laughs> I still have the boat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's like, you freeze. Oh, my oh gosh. the shame. <laughs> the humiliation. Shame. I'll never forget this guy's face. Like I was 12 years old, right? Okay. Oops. Okay. If I could whisper something in the ear of my younger self, I would say... And I'd probably say something very loving. Um, part of me wanted to be playful, but I'd probably say something loving because that's what I needed to hear. I'd probably say that you are loved, you matter, and it's all going to be okay. That's what I would say. 
because I think that's what I needed to hear the most. And it's funny because I've said this so many times on my show, so my audience is going to get tired of me saying this, but I'm going to show you this. Uh, over a year ago, I put a photo of my younger self wow. on my screensaver, uh -huh. right? I've talked about this so many times now. And so for the last year, this is my, my therapist, Clara, had me do work on my inner child, mm -hmm. on healing the relationship that I had with myself back then and really having intimate conversations, exercises with the five, six, seven-year-old that, I, that was sexually abused. I've talked about that with you before, which I never really fully healed, you know, that whole conversation with. And it's been a beautiful journey to have intimacy, connection, you know, and bridge the gap from five, six, seven till now and be able to have a conversation between that space and time and really bring the two together, you know, my inner child mm -hmm. into me. So what through would healing. this one say to you? What would he say to me? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, um, that's a good. Actually, that's really good. May I bring him back? Yeah, yeah. What does he say to you? Oh my gosh, he probably says, "Let me think. I'm getting my heart here." He says, "Thank you, thank you for being willing to be courageous in all these scary emotions." All the scary emotions that I'm feeling right now, the things that I'm uncertain about, the things that I'm afraid of, thank you for having the courage to dive in and be, uh, you know, put all your emotions on the table, address the messiness, handle it all, and supporting me in finding peace and healing that I've always wanted. That's what it, that's what it would say, yeah. So, yeah, I know it's, it's crazy. Crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to the next one. This is what I do. I laugh when things get deep. <laughs> I laugh. You I know, get deep, and then I'm laugh, like, okay. You laugh while your tears are streaming down of your course, face. Of course, of course. Okay, this is you. <laughs> Oops. I would sell everything to be able to. Mm. It's interesting. I don't have a dream, you know, I live a lot of my dreams at this moment. So I don't feel like I, I would sell, but I think if I was to, I would sell everything to remain healthy. Yeah. Or I would sell everything for my kids or my partner to be healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I needed to, like, I would go everywhere in the world just if, to make sure that if there's something that can keep them it's not just alive it's healthy yeah because i don't want them just not to, just suffering and alive yeah, yeah 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 i think that at this point that's the only that's is that the is only, that the biggest fear for you um yes but you see when i say i live with dread <laughs> you, you when you jumped at, like really <laughs> <laughs> because it's not the you know I live with the fear of loss. It's not it's not dread just bad things happening. It what's underneath is the fact that my parents had lost everybody mm -hmm. and so their entire families they were the only two that came out and I rem I I this is part of my DNA and so the fear of loss of traumatic loss and the grief that's what I fear. Yeah. So health or selling everything or you know imagining myself you know, cruising the world to find the best doctor mm -hmm. that could help Solutions, me yeah, yeah. Yes, with something is part of preventing that loss. You know, have you had major losses? No, In except uh, actually, I on a personal level have not, but I often, you know, if, if, if one of them drives, I often at night, they're worried, you know, I, I just. I'm, I've never said don't go, but right, I just well, like the little call when they arrive. You're like my mom too. I, I, am, I can fa easily imagine accidents. Oh, man. I can easily imagine, th th yes, I am a catastrophizer in mm -hmm. that sense, you know. Um, but I, so what does therapy do? It, it allows you to just, in the mind, it's like, no, it is, you're it fine. You go out, it calms you. And, but I still like the call. <laughs> of course, this is assurance. You know, so it, the, the fear is loss. Mm -hmm. And the dread is the manifestation of that fear. Mm. So I would sell everything 
actually, I don't know what it's like. I could put it like that. I would sell everything to be able to live without dread. Ooh. That would probably be the... What would it take from you? I don't know. To process I, 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 you to know, let that go. What's it, I, I look at people who don't have those fears and I, I think that they are free of this. It's like, what does life look like without worry? Peaceful. You know, <laughs> you know they have inside. other things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't, I, They have other, other things, stresses, but yeah. it's an amazing thing when I see people who don't have, you know, they, that is not their thing. Yeah. I don't have their things. You don't have but jealousy is, or insecurity. No, yeah. I don't have that. Do you work with a therapist yourself? I have. I don't do. I don't work with a therapist at this moment, but I have over the many years of my life. Yes, I've do you had. Th do you think it's important for therapists to have therapists? Absolutely, absolutely. You, you, you. First of all, if you don't, then you you will be triggered by things that people bring into your office and you will be projecting things on them that don't belong to them. We call that counter-transference. Mm -hmm. So, ah. you know, there, there is what people put on you, but there is what you put on them. Because you have something unresolved. Or there or... is what you can't work with because of what is happening inside oh, of you. Oh, wow. So it's an so essential. you've got to be cleansing yourself constantly it's probably. Essential. Interesting. What do you think? You said you haven't had a therapist in a while or worked with one in a while. Where do you think... What would, what would I go to for today? Yeah, what would you? What would be available for you today if you uh, were today doing? Today I it? would go to a coach because uh -huh. I need practical help. <laughs> it's it's less internal mm -hmm. at this moment. Yes, um, it's more it, it, I, I, it's more practical things. I, I What's don't, holding you back from? I don't. I I, no. may, I, I talk. I, I am. A person who likes to receive help, yeah, so I yeah. don't. Uh, you just haven't found the right coach. I or... wrote a whole piece recently about asking for help in the blog, and because I realized that it's very easy for me to ask for help. Actually, when we met early, early on, I asked for help. Absolutely. And I just thought, You're like I'm, I've never done this marketing stuff. Yes, but yeah. like I know nothing about marketing. <laughs> You're like the genius marketer. I'm a therapist uh -huh. who suddenly finds that, and I just thought I know people sure. and they can help me and. I don't feel like I have no problem saying I know nothing about mm -hmm. this, but I because I know I trust what I do know a lot about, sure. and this is new for me. So sure. I don't experience it as belittling, or admitting, or vulnerable. Or I think it's an amazing thing to ask for help. I love, and by the way, I did ask on social. I asked people. You know, how do you feel about asking for help? And like 70 something percent of people said, I don't do it. I don't mm -hmm. like it. That doesn't make me feel good, etc. And then I said, and how do you feel when other people ask you for help? And the same 70 percent said, I love it. Hmm. And I'm thinking, you know what? It's like when other people ask, you don't think they're stupid. They don't know they're vulnerable. They're, they're, they're you know, you think You're, you want to help. You yeah. want to help. Yeah. Well, why don't you think that when you ask for help, yeah. other people enjoy that too? Right. So I'm big into the asking for help these days. And therapy is a piece of that. At this moment, therapy is not the thing that you need I one. need. Yeah. I, but that doesn't mean that, you know, Jack thinks I should meditate. Mm. That actually, so I, maybe you need a meditation coach. Or, so yeah. I do. I do, but in movement. I get yeah. calm when yeah, I when move. When you're walking or I hiking. I don't or, sit. <laughs> that does not work for me. And What's the one thing that triggers you the most that you would like to evolve beyond what's the thing that irritates, irritates you or triggers me. you or bureaucrats rigidity mm. rigidity uh, which is the opposite of playfulness yeah. not flexibility yeah. right yeah. and arbitrariness rules for the sake of rules yeah bureaucracy um you know in the big sense of the word and bureaucrats as a whole mm -hmm. you know um that you know things that uh, you know rigidity which means that you write you don't listen to others um you you make your point i mean conversations that are not conversations people that yell at each other for the mm -hmm. sake of yelling at each yeah. other cancel culture from all sides um, Frustrator, I, yeah. Yes. I mean, my work is about helping people have the difficult conversations that they need to have, want to have, don't know how to have. As long as I, they want to, I can do something. Right. If they think they know it all, and if they think they know you even better than you know yourself, mm -hmm. and that they have no curiosity, I find that challenging. Yeah. I love curiosity. I hate 
What's the opposite of curiosity? Fixed, yeah. Yeah, certainty. But yeah. certainty is the enemy of change. Right, right. What things do you wish you had done differently? What pieces do you wish that your partner had seen and accepted from you differently? Mm -hmm. Where did you wish you would have said less and where did you wish you would have said more? What do you learn from this relationship?